All right, let's talk covalent bonds. A covalent bond is made when atoms share electrons. So rather than one atom just giving a whole electron to the other one, they both share the electrons and they both act like they have the whole electron. Okay, this kind of messed with me. I assumed like they would, like they're sharing, so they each get half an electron. No, they're sharing, they each get the whole electron. So the electrons, because they are negatively charged and opposites attract, they are attracted to the negative, um, the, sorry, they're negative, they're attracted to the protons, the positive charge inside the nucleus of the other atom. That's what holds the covalent bond together. So water, H2O, is a covalent molecule. Now this is important. I want you to know that water itself is a covalent molecule because we're gonna talk in a minute about the bonds that hold water molecules to each other, and that's a different bond. So the water molecule itself is covalent. So the hydrogen has one electron, wants two. The oxygen has six electrons. It's got two in a pair, two in a pair, and then these two here, unpaired. Always want paired electrons, okay? So we get two hydrogens to share those electrons. The hydrogen has two, each hydrogen has two, and the oxygen has eight, okay? Now notice when we draw them like this, we're drawing in the um, electrons. As you can imagine, that gets pretty old and tedious pretty quickly. So when we draw molecules, we usually just use a line to show a pair of electrons. And then the electrons that aren't involved in bonding, we don't show them, okay, we don't draw them in. All right, water is a polar molecule. And that means that one end of the molecule has more negative charge than the other. And that happens because the oxygen atom is so much bigger than the hydrogen atoms. Like it's huge compared to hydrogen. It's still tiny, okay? But compared to the hydrogen, it's massive. And so the negative charge, the or sorry, the positive, the six protons inside this nucleus, they have make a huge pull on this one little electron of the hydrogen. So there's more negative charge on one side of the water molecule than on the other. So we have say it has a pole. It has a negative pole and a positive pole. The positive is pole is not positively charged, just less negative. All right, so because of those poles, water molecules are held to each other with hydrogen bonds. Now, this is weird to me because you would think hydrogen bonds would be like between hydrogens, but it's not. It's because the hydrogens have a weak energy in the mo water molecule. So the hydrogen bond is the bond between the oxygen of one water molecule and a hydrogen of another water molecule. And that's because the hydrogens are like, I lost my electron and it's really far away from me. You've got an electron, can I be close to you? And so the hydrogen bonds individually are very, very weak. They're not actually sharing an electron. They're not giving an electron. It's just this, there's some, some more positive charge here and a lot of negative charge here. And remember, opposites attract. So the positive uh, end of the water molecule, of one water molecule is attracted to the ne negative end of another water molecule. All right, now individually, hydrogen bonds are very weak like nothing, but there are a lot of water molecules in water and together those hydrogen bonds are very, very strong. That's gonna be super important. Now, the other thing about water is that because it's polar, it is super attractive to ions because remember opposites attract and ions are charged. So let's say you take salt water. The, in its crystal form, salt um, is sodium and chloride ions packed together in a really specific way. When you introduce water, the sodium ion is like, I got all this positive charge and these water molecules have this big negative charge like chloride, I like you, but <laughs> come on, look at all of these waters I can be attracted to. And chloride is like, see a dude, have you seen all the little hydrogens around here? Like there's a lot of positive charge going on here. 
So they dissociate, and that's what dissolving is. It is where the ions separate from each other, but they keep whatever electrons they had as ions. They stay in their ionized form. Okay, so that's what happens when you dissolve salt in water. All right, so here we have a polar bear and a brown bear. And the polar bear says, help, help, I'm dissolving. And the brown bear says, but bears are insoluble. And he says, that's easy for you to say, you're not polar. Because <laughs> polar things dissolve in water. Because pole water, this pole like dissolves like. Now you must be thinking, hang on, what's nonpolar? Oil isn't nonpolar. So if you want to dissolve something in oil, the thing you dissolve needs to also be nonpolar. Ta da! All right, hydrogen bonds super strong together. They create cohesion, which is the tendency of the molecules to stick together. And that cohesion is what enables plants to pull water all the way up through, like through a tree, all the way up to the leaves. The water molecules evaporate from the leaves. And every time one evaporates, it pulls another molecule up through these tubes in the tree or the plant because they're held together by hydrogen bonds. Okay. Now, this is not, um, cohesion doesn't move water around your body. You have a circulatory system for that. Cohesion does create surface tension, which is cool and is important in your body physiologically. Um, and it does things like enable insects that are very, very light and less dense than water to sit on the water and be reflected perfectly. Isn't that cool? Um, and there's also, a uh, animals that can spread out their weight enough that they can float on water or walk on water. This is the same, it's the same kind of species. It's called a Jesus lizard because it walks on water and it's just so elegant looking when it does it, isn't it? Okay. It makes me laugh every time. All right. One of the other cool things about water is that water is one of the rare things that gets bigger when it freezes. Most things, when they freeze, they get smaller, but water gets bigger. So the reason is that liquid water, there is enough energy that the water molecules are moving around and they're bumping off each other. And so the hydrogen bonds are changing the length of the bond. They're getting longer, they're getting smaller as the water molecules bounce off of each other. And because of that, the water molecules can actually be closer together than the hydrogen bonds would be in a stable form. When you take the energy slash heat out of liquid water and you make ice, then there's not as much energy to move the water molecules around and the hydrogen bonds become stable and they make these lovely little six-sided um, shapes, hexagons, and they make a, a strong lattice that holds the water molecules together as ice. And this, my friends, is why snowflakes have six points because the water molecules are held together as hexagons. In, by hydrogen bonds. How cool is that? So because the ice gets bigger when it forms, it's bigger than the water, it is less dense. And because of that, it floats. And that means that when the top of a lake freezes, the water under it is actually insulated from the air above and it stays at a fairly stable temperature. How cool is that? All right. So how do we figure out what kind of a molecule, a co what, how a covalent molecule is going to go together? We figured that out for, ion, for ions, right? For an ionic molecule. We're going to just even up the, uh, the charges. For covalent molecules, we're going to look at the unpaired electrons in an atom, and each one of those is going to try to make a bond. If there aren't enough things to make a bond, they're going to make double or sometimes triple bonds, sharing two or three pairs of electrons. So let's look at carbon. Carbon has one, two electrons in its first shell, and then it has one, two, three, four electrons in its second shell. Now that could be 
two paired elect two pairs of electrons, but that's not how they work. They actually go into the shells one at a time. And then after there are four, then they double up and pair. So carbon has four unpaired electrons. So here we go. Here's our outer shell with our four unpaired electrons. If you think about it, if these paired up, then there'd be like this space and that would be even less stable, all right? Oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell. So the ox each oxygen wants to share two electrons and carbon wants to share four electrons. So the way they do that is oxygen moves two of its electrons over, shares those with carbon, and so they make a double bond on either side of the carbon. So this is drawing the um, arrangement of the electrons. I will not make you draw these, okay? But if you if it helps you visualize it, then go ahead and draw the electrons in. The way we would normally draw this molecule is like this, with the carbon in the middle, and then two lines showing a double bond to the oxygen and then double bond oxygen. And yeah, that's carbon dioxide. Pretty stable because everybody now has a full eight electrons in their outer shell. Make sense? So if you look here, nitrogen, if carbon has four valence electrons and oxygen has six, then nitrogen's gonna, nitrogen's gonna have five, right? So nitrogen happily makes three bonds. Oxygen makes two bonds. Fluorine, one, okay? All right, so how do we name them? You look at this pattern and you tell me. Carbon dioxide, CO2. Carbon monoxide, monoxide, CO. Carbon disulfide, CS2. Nitrogen oxide, NO. N2O, dinitrogen oxide. SF6, sulfur hexafluoride. NCl3, nitrogen trichloride. So what it seems like is they all end in I. And most of them do. There's some that have specialized names. Don't worry about those. We'll come to those later. Okay. So what you do is the, the element name of the first non-metal covalent molecules are normally between non-metals, although they can also be between two metals. And then the first syllable of the second one plus, and then change the end to ide. So carbon and then oxygen. We take the ox and then we add ide, okay? So carbon oxide. Now, if there are multiple ways to put these nonmetals together, then we add a prefix to show that we've got two of something or more of something. So since we have one, car one oxygen here and two oxygens here, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. If you're looking at carbon monoxide and thinking, hang on, carbon wants four bonds and oxygen wants two, how is this a thing? Yeah, it's not the most stable molecule, which is why it's really bad inside your body because it's gonna bind to oxygen more readily than other things. And your body kind of needs that oxygen. I digress. All right, so here we have nitrogen oxide, one of each. And then because there are two different ways of doing this, we put a two in front of the first N or after the first N, so we have dinitrogen, so two nitrogens and then oxide. And then we have these, these prefixes you've probably heard before, okay? Um, mono meaning one, di meaning two, tri for three, tetra four, penta five, hexa six, hepta seven, octa eight, nona nine, and deca 10. We don't use these very often. Mostly mono and di are the ones that are really important. Try sometimes, okay? So there you go. That's how you name your covalent molecules. That was pretty easy, right? All right, let's finish.